Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, dance visionary James Sewell's unique choreography of classical and contemporary ballet has inspired audiences for more than 20 years. Sculptor Alan Christian chisels bowling balls and welds kitchen utensils in his quirky universe he calls the House of Balls. He is a founding member of the alt-country band The Jayhawks. Singer-songwriter Mark Olson releases his second solo album. These artists and more now on Minnesota Original. I'll give you a full eight into it. Yes, good idea. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, two. Okay, great. Yes, yes, yes. That really made a difference. Nick, would it be possible for you to do a chasse? So turning out and chasse, three, four, five. When I started out um, to have the security to start a piece, I would need to kind of know where the whole piece was going. Nowadays, I want the creative process to be a journey. I have a starting point, either a seed of what I want to explore, or I have a goal of what I want the piece to achieve, but I don't know how it's going to achieve it. Then I know that the piece will be a journey that will take me to places that I couldn't have thought of in advance. When people watch good dancing, they can kind of vicariously experience what it would be like to do things that they can't do. And every day I work with my dancers to bring that quality to all of our pieces. So let's just try all to connect all of that now. And five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two. One. here in the studio working on Shadow's Light and trying to get the choreography finished. That's always a battle and, and that goes on to the last minute. And we've got one more week before we go into the theater for tech. It's typical that things come together oftentimes during tech week that we actually finish choreographing. Ideally you get done you know the week before and you have at least a couple of days to just be working on this stuff but that's a challenge you know things it's it seems like the creative process is like a gas, that it ex expands to fill the container of time that it has. Um, but we want to get the arc okay. done so we can put it together with the musicians when they get here. Is that right? Yeah, and then that's where we were going to just figure out that next thing. We had you jumping up to maybe into James Hill Ballet is a contemporary ballet company. Somebody asked me recently what that means, contemporary ballet. And I kind of came up in my mind, I realized, well, think about modern dance and then put people in point shoes. It's not strict classical ballet. Like my mother would say, that's not ballet. Um, really? We're wearing tutus sometimes. Mm, still, she just knows. She knew. <laughs> we're based in the ballet technique, and a lot of the pieces are in point, but we're combining elements um, that might be considered modern dance, contact improvisation, gymnastics, theater, you kind of anything. Whatever comes into my mind is what we're going to do. I'm not ever limiting myself to the vocabulary that makes up ballet. James, was that close musically? I think that it was. Okay. I think if you create a piece with the same process, the piece is going to come out kind of the same. So I found myself over the 70-some ballets I've done needing to continually evolve the process with which I make them. I think the body of work is um, really vast. It's hard to believe one person choreographed this work. And it speaks to the dancers that we've hired and their willingness to sometimes feel very square and robotic and a cog and a big machine, and then at other times be very vulnerable and uh, expressive and bring something very personal to the role. But let's just pick it up right on the top of Unfinished Business. Okay. Now, okay. We're in the studio today pulling the elements together for Shadow's Light. We've got the gamelan finally in the studio with us, and we're gonna see how we can get the musicians coordinated with the dancers. 
I was inspired by the gamelan, just the sound of those instruments. And when I heard the, the international novelty gamelan playing, the way they combine these ancient instruments but playing all their own original music, really I related to that because I have, I work with this um, art form that's hundreds of years old, ballet, but try to find new ways to use that. So we've got to get, Sally's weight has got to be passed further backwards. It's staying way too far out in front of, of Corey. Let's try the roll up. Let's just do the lift and make sure we know what we want to have happen. So, and going back. One, two, three. That's it, no, I got it. And you know, you guys, it's better to be late and not fall over. <laughs> It's always been important to me to have a working environment where people are enjoying what they do. The way that feeds me artistically is that I know that the most creative state of being is the state of play. When you feel like you're playing, that's when the magic happens. And when you're forcing it and working hard at it, it doesn't flow. I went through so many phases as a kid. I started playing violin at age six. And I was really into gymnastics. I was a competitive gymnast. And I was really into magic. All these phases. But the funny thing is, when I started dancing, they all kind of came together. There was the athleticism of the gymnastics, the music, the performing. All of it was there. And it just took off for me. I started taking 20 classes a week at age 15. And a year and a half later, I moved to New York and spent uh, 15 years there dancing. When we moved here to the Twin Cities, we decided, well, let's just take on the battle of the B word and do what we do and educate people that ballet isn't this stuffy old art form, you know, that it, it's contemporary, it is moving forward, it can be to all different kinds of music, and um, it can relate to their lives the way they live them today. Shadows Light is a ballet that tries to combine elements of the East and West to come together to create our own new myth of the development of a society. It starts out in this spirit world where we have these gods that are the shadow puppets and sort of creating man. And then we see them appear in color and we see the proliferation of people multiplying and, 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 uh, and then they come forward out of the, the shadow world into the world of light. As these people develop then as a society, as they come out, um, there's one person who becomes afflicted. Just the idea that, that we uh, encounter suffering. And the people turn to the shadow world to find a way to have a ritual to heal him. And they're trying to recreate what magically happened in a very um, human way, but to somehow bring an effect about uh, to heal this person and release something that he can be whole again. The last section uh, is really a celebration. You know, he's been released of, of, of his affliction and the whole community rallies together um, in celebration of the wholeness. I think art in general aspires to help people see themselves in their world in a new way. In our society, the arts have been relegated to the realm of entertainment. And indeed, they need to be entertaining to in, in, engage and give you a reason to go. But really, I think the arts are a way a society um, adjust to change. I hope that my work changes the way people think about ballet and maybe opens up some ideas about what it can be. Um, I hope that it touches people's lives in ways that they, they see themselves up there and maybe find a way to see themselves within their world in a new way.
It's always been about trying to find the essence of humanity through found objects, through inanimate objects that are cast offs to try and give these inanimate objects a new lease on life, to imbue them with emotion. And you know, it's a, obviously a difficult thing when you're dealing with, a, with an old fire hydrant, but I think it still can be done and I'm, I'm certainly up to the challenge. Well, people walk through the door and they say, what is the House of Balls? And I, I say the, the House of Balls, more than anything, is my studio. Yes, it can be seen as a gallery, as a museum, as, as a repository. To me, when I walk in here, it's where I create. So it is my studio. It just happens to be accessible and open to you to enter into. My work has, has evolved from not exclusively bowling balls, but it was a large majority of what I did, to frying pans, to piano parts, to whatever, whatever's out there. My ideas come from, uh, and this is a stock answer which I give everyone, I wake up, and that's enough for me. I don't try and determine beforehand in some ways what it can do or what it can't. Part of it is the experimentation of seeing whether it will or won't. Um, and that's kind of the attitude I take about making art. You're experimenting, you're playing, and you're trying to have fun. And, uh, and hopefully there's a, a message or something instilled in that work that, that is passed on. But, the objective is to, is to play. I have a lot to show you today, so get ready. This is a piece I did called Three Faces of Steve, and these are all made out of piano parts. 
I'm known for bowling balls. This is one of my favorite, personally. This is Drink My Blood Jesus. I would like to actually have a, a sangria party where I've got a pump underneath here that would be pumping sangria or Bloody Marys. I used to play a lot of badminton and I love bone, to carve bone. It's got quality, light qualities that I find really intriguing. These are the mass type of figures in one second become somebody else. The frying pans are masks. They're something that I create to hold in front of oneself, either to, to unmask yourself or to become uh, an, another person. But you also have that essence of the person that cooked with them. Those elements I try and retain because they epitomize what this person was like and I think they also give emotion to the piece and uh, enhance it. This is one that has that residue of, of someone's life. Now you leave that in there because to me it, this is the patina of their life. But then you can put it on and you know it accentuates who I've become. Well these are long uh, ongoing series of, of uh, puppets that I made for a troupe out of New York. Right now I'm into the silverware phase, doing heads, doing puppets, doing masks over the last 10 years. Working on a large scale figure right now. This is gonna be a life size, bigger than life size actually. I don't think it'll be a puppet, but it's going to be all silverware. One of my favorite personal pieces was the piece I did for the Science Museum called Transformation, based after Rodin's The Thinker. It's about ideas and the moments that we understand. This is a piece I brought to Burning Man this year called Little Big Bird. Since 2001, I've gone to Burning Man seven times. And Burning Man is an arts festival in Nevada. It's about what is the gift you bring to the larger community. There is the most amazing sculpture, and it's got the scale that blows people away. You know, and of course, I drive Elmer, my art car, who is an expression of myself. Well, you never know what I'm going to make, but I got a platter, and that's uh, good enough for me. As my mother always told me, safety first. You don't know how things are going to connect. And so it's really having a vast assortment of things you can choose from. And I may have a, a stance I'm looking for or an emotion I'm trying to capture, but how I get there is how the process unfolds before me. I would hope that my work, especially leaving here, because then it enters somebody else's life and they become a caretaker. And, and I would hope that, that there's an essence, an element left for them that enriches their life. That's all I want to do is to try and enrich somebody else's life. It's that easy, kids. It's that easy. Have fun. Are the days I remember to live again in the country, to dream again as we once did. These are the days I remember. What would you do at the end of the day if you lost everything that was good? Stand up and fight, would you turn, take flight? Please tell me, cause I'm asking you. Little bird of freedom, fly our way, yeah, yeah. Little bird of freedom, fly our way in the evening. What I've done for most of my life is uh, write songs and play music, and for the most part, music and Writing songs has been um, sort of my purpose. Our life is a river, our dreams to remember.
remember Our life is a river Our dreams to remember I grew up in uh, Minnesota uh, I have relatives in Faribault, Ottertail County, and I grew up in St. Louis Park. My dad was the only one that left the farm. And from there, I ended up at one point moving out with my grandmother to California, and that's where I got the idea about writing songs because she read so many books and she talked, she had this kind of lilting talk, and she got in my head with her voice. And they had records. And I thought, I'm going to write songs. And she said, no, you're not. You're going to go to college. But I kept at it. I ended up coming back to Minnesota. And I came to this place here, First Avenue. And I saw some bands playing. And I got hooked. I was just attracted to Woody Guthrie and really old stuff. But at the same time, I was seeing all these punk bands, too. And I started playing with a rockabilly band called Stagger Lee. Then I played with the Jayhawks. And that was the beginning of how I was able to play music for my life was, was working with the band, trying to get a, a sound that was our own. At the same time, my family was saying, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. Why aren't you in college? I, I had this feeling that it, there was something good was gonna happen with that because we kept slowly, slowly progressing. So People ask me why I left the Jayhawks, and I, it, I was in the band for over a decade, and I wasn't in the best physical shape because I'd been part of a rock and roll band in every sense. And I was pretty much beat up and run down. And at the same time, I just had gotten married for the first time. I've only been married once. I got back in shape physically and mentally, and then after a year, we started playing together as the Creek Dippers and we made seven records. I give my heart to you Just cause you're sweet and true Now I have a solo album. It's called Many Colored Kite. Will you go our way through this line? I can say the words to tell you of a many-colored kite. Many-colored kite. I went out in the park, and I'm banging away on the dulcimer, and there's a stranger out there who comes up to me and starts talking to me, wants to know about the dulcimer, who am I, what am I doing here? And he was from a different culture. And so the idea of that led to the idea of the title of the song, Many-Colored Kite, of people from different cultures. You can be Ain't talking about any rivers You can see Well, you I think that sometimes in newspapers and maybe in legislation, there's an idea that we need to clamp down against all the different cultures. So I was trying to say how much I appreciated the fact that in my life I've been able to meet people from different cultures, it's always been a, an experience that, it, that like opens your mind. It, it, there's just no other way around it. There's a light that shines There are dreams untold Dreams that rise up to the sky When I started out, I went to school on country, folk, and rock in a way. And I was trying to find ways to play this type of music. And now that I've done those years of apprenticeship, so to speak, now when I pick up the guitar or the piano or the dulcimer and I start to sing and try to write a song, I just take a deep breath and then I just start playing and, I, and all the experience of playing over these years and the different styles and then I try to come up with a sound that's just coming out of me that, that works. A lot of the songs over the years are about people that I have known and I try to tell it in a heroic kind of way where there's some spiritual dilemma in their life and how they react to it and how they, you know, bust through the, <laughs> bust through the stuff. I, I kind of think of it in sort of a spiritual sense, like it's something that you do that is more than just ordinary life. That's how I think of music. 
no time to live without her Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs>